Hey guys, how is your day going? I hope it's going better than mine. I've had a rough week, let me tell ya. Cars are breaking down, household objects are breaking down, everything's breaking down. It's cold outside, it's like in the negative degrees. I don't like cold. <laughs> it's... Mm -hmm. Okay, anyways. Today we are going to be talking about the case of Star Faithful. It's an older case. Star Faithful was born Marion Star Wyman on January 27th, 1906 in Evanston, Illinois. Her parents were Frank Wyman, who was her birth father, and Helen Pierce McGregor Wyman was her mother. And then she ended up later in life marrying Stanley E. Faithful, who became Star's stepfather. Star also had a younger sister who was born in 1911 named Elizabeth Tucker. So Star's family, they didn't have a lot of money, but her mother came from, came from a lot of, her, her mom came from a lot of money, so they were able to use the money given to them from her mom's side of the family and they, they sent both Star and her sister Elizabeth to private schools. The main source of this money came from Helen's cousins, the Peters. Helen's cousin Martha married Andrew J. Peters he was a career politician. He served in the House of Representatives, Congress, and Treasury. Peters was also friends with Calvin Coolidge, um, who at the time he was the then gover governor of Massachusetts. Andrew was also friends with Theodore Roosevelt, who um, at the time when they were friends, he Theodore Roosevelt was the governor of New York. Also the governor of New York during the, uh, the time of Starr's death. So Andrew Peters would often take both of the sisters with him on trips and the three of them would like stay in hotels and stuff, which I guess he was kind of like an uncle. It was in 1924 when Star's parents separated and Helen ended up marrying Stanley Faithful. Stanley was a self-proclaimed inventor. Uh, he, he was very poor. He didn't earn a lot of money. So again, most of the funding that the family, because Helen took the, took the sisters her daughters and they moved in with Stanley and most of their income actually came from Helen's family the Peters uh, provided them with most of their money so it was during her teenage years Star started showing some started acting strangely she started showing signs of like something not quite right psychologically signs of emotional disturbance she uh, Star did get some psychiatric treatment and at one point did stay in a mental hospital. In June 1926, Star told her mother that Andrew Peters has been sexually abusing her since she was 11 years old. She claimed that he would drug her and then sexually abuse her. In 1927, a year later, uh, Stanley Faithful, her stepfather, ended up getting an attorney and they arranged that the Peters would pay them money in order for them to keep these accusations these accusations and um the abuse secret they agreed that the peters would pay the faithful twenty thousand dollars but but it's believed that the faithful um were like extorting money from peters because in the end they ended up getting in the end they ended up receiving around eighty thousand dollars so it was supposed to be twenty thousand and now they have eighty thousand by the end of all of this so most of this money her family, Star's family, actually used to fund Star's new lifestyle. She was constantly partying, she would go on cruises, she would travel all around the world um, and check in hotels with, with random people and do drugs and drink and party and have a lot of sex with a lot of different people. In 1931, Star was hospitalized in New York City after being found after being found drunk, naked, and beaten in her hotel room. She was also then later, or at one point, was hospitalized when she was in London for overdosing on some um, sleeping pills. So a few days before her death, on May 29th, 1931, Star attended a party. This party was held on a cruise liner called the Francona. And she went to this party because she wanted to see the ship's doctor. Uh, his name was Dr. George Jameson Carr. They, Star considered this doctor the love of her life. She was totally infatuated with him, but the feeling was not mutual. She attended this party and Carr, the doctor Carr, he 
entertained her in his room until it was time for the ship to leave and then he tried to get her out of his room. She, instead of getting off the boat though and, and returning to the dock, she instead tried to stay on the, uh, on the deck and was later found once, once the ship was taken, was taken off and they found out that she didn't have a ticket. She couldn't even afford a ticket even if she wanted to, but she didn't have a ticket so they ended up putting her on a, she was then forced off the ship and was returned back to the pier via a tugboat and apparently the whole way back to the pier she was screaming the whole way. There were also reports that she tried doing this other previous time, storing, storing herself away on ships, but those weren't officially, um, determined or so star faithful was last seen by her family on the morning of friday june 5th 1931 at 9 30 a.m her family said she was wearing a yellow dress and she reportedly went to the doctors to visit some ship's officers which is something she frequently did she would always go to the dock she'd hang out with all these officers these doctors these people who worked on boats and then once a certain boat left she would just kind of like go to the next boat and just kind of work her way down and she'd just spend all of her time with the people who worked on these cruise lines. So she reportedly went to the dock to see a uh, specific officer and sh to uh, spend the evening with them. So between the time she went missing that um, morning of Friday June 5th and, and that morning of Monday June 8th there's been a lot of different reports on what what happened because she told her mom she was with doing one thing and then that person was like no I haven't seen her and then her friends were like oh well, she did this and then she told a friend something else and so everyone was told different stories and everyone had slightly different stories so it was not 100% sure what she did do in those um, few days where she was kind of missing but what was recorded and what I could find was on that Friday that she left a newsstand vendor who she frequently visited to get newspapers from said that they saw her at 11.30 a.m. So she left her house at 9.30 a.m. and then was seen again for sure at 11.30 a.m. So we don't know what happened in that two hour gap. I don't, I, I don't live in New York so I don't, I don't live there so I don't know how long taxi drives take, if she took a taxi, if she walked, I don't know. But she was seen at 11.30 a.m. At 1 p.m. a taxi driver picked her and an, an unknown man up and drove them to their new destination. This man was in a ship uniform and she told the unknown man that she would see him later and um, see him again at 4 p.m., but he told her no. He told her to not return to the docks. The taxi ended up dropping her off at her home, but uh, they did not see her actually enter the home. They left before, you know, they just dropped her off and left. They didn't check, and then the taxi ended up taking the unknown man back to the pier. So around 2 p.m., so this is about an hour after she was first dropped off. The same taxi driver picked her up again at the pier. This time she was highly intoxicated. And the um, she was put in the taxi by the same man as the first time. And the man told her not to let not for her to come back and told the taxi driver not to let her come back. Star was only in this taxi for a few blocks though because she did not have enough money to make it all the way back home so after a few blocks uh, taxi pulled over let her out and they said they watched her walk back towards the pier. So between 2 and 3 30 p.m. she was seen again by at a beauty shop that she frequented. Uh, she was there to talk about her appointment. Then after that she was seen, I couldn't find an exact time, but she was seen on a party that was happening on a cruise liner, but the cruise liner was set to deport at 5 p.m. and she was reportedly seen leaving the cruise liner before 5, so she was not on the boat when it left. She was for sure off the boat. After she left the first boat though, she was, then went to another boat, as I said, this was something she frequent, frequently did. Um, she was at that boat until around 10 p.m. After 10 p.m., she got into a taxi and went to another boat to attend another party. So on Saturday, June 6th, this is the next day, some 
witnesses told police, we're not 100% sure what happened, but witnesses told police that someone fitting Star's description was seen at the Tape Hotel, Tops, Tapes, Tops Hotel. Um, she was seen with a man and they were arguing, but then she later was seen maybe leaving with a group of a group of men. This same evening, Saturday, June 6th, her stepfather ended up reporting her missing. Although this is where it gets kind of weird because not only did they report her missing, but her stepfather and her mother also sent a letter to Peters, the uncle that I mentioned earlier who was accused of sexually abusing her and was giving them money. They sent a letter to him telling him that she was missing and that they needed more money. On the morning of Monday, June 8th in 1931, around 6.30 a.m., a beachcomber at Long Beach found the body of Star Faithful. She was still wearing her dress and her stockings and the little clippy things that hold the stockings in place. She was still wearing those, but she was missing her underwear, her, like, outer outerwear like her coat and stuff and any accessories she had was not on her. Her body was also covered in bruises and later in an autopsy determined that these bruises happened before her death, most likely inflicted by someone else. So this is where it also gets kind of weird because there's two different autopsy reports and they kind of conflict against each other. The first autopsy report said that she her cause of death was drowning, and she had been in the water for at least 48 hours. That placed her time of death either um, late that Friday night or early that Saturday morning. But then another autopsy report said that she was in the water for only 10 hours, which then would place her time of death late that Sunday night. Her lungs were filled with a lot of sand, so that meant that she died or drowned in more shallower water. It was also found that she had eaten a very large meal two or three to four hours before her death, although she had not drank any alcohol for at least 36 hours before her death. Even though the autopsy said she hadn't drank any alcohol within 36 hours of her death, there were numerous reports from like taxi drivers and other witnesses that were saying she was very intoxicated throughout most of the time they saw her. She was going from party to party to party, and most of the taxi drivers said she was intoxicated when she was in their car. So, she also had some drugs in her system, several different kinds of drugs, but none of them were enough to have killed her. Some of these drugs were drugs that she was taken frequently, like she was prescribed, and then some of them were, she's going to all these parties, she got more drugs. Um, but as I mentioned, none of these drugs were enough to kill her. Maybe leave her a little out of it, but not enough to kill her. So the autopsy report kind of conflicts themselves again because as I said there were two different ones. The first autopsy report said that she was raped, but the second autopsy report said she wasn't raped but she did have sex shortly before her death. But I'm not sure how they could figure out if the sex was consensual or if she was raped unless someone came forward. But then again, that's only one side of the story. We don't know. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's like a different... I, I don't know. So I don't know how you could tell the difference between if she was raped or if she had voluntary sex, but uh, basically we can determine that she did have sex, we just don't know if it was consensual or not. So at first her death, her case was seen as a homicide, it was acted upon accordingly like it was a homicide, but then there was also suspicion that it could have been a suicide or an accidental death, like she fell off one of those many cruise liners or something of that sort. So her family, her the faithful, her mom and her stepfather, um, actually accused Peter of killing her, like trying to get rid of her because she they were getting money from him and she was like threatening to expose him. But this actually did the opposite of what they wanted. They wanted to shift attention to Andrew Peters, but instead ended up shifting attention to them. And it made them become suspects in this case because they, they didn't cooperate with the police and then they were also, and police didn't quite understand why they would want to throw Peters under the bus if it was his money that they had been living off of for years. So it, uh, Star's death is still unsolved. It's, we don't know if it was a homicide or a suicide or accidental. We have no idea, but there are several theories. So her, um, her case was led by the Nassau Con County Police, uh, Inspector Harold King, and the District Attorney Elvin Edwards. 
and Assistant District Attorney Martin Littleton Jr. So after identifying her body, um, Stanley, her stepfather, uh, first he said that he, he believed that Andrew Peters was the one who killed her, but when he first told them this, he didn't say any names. He just said he thinks he knows someone and that she was corrupted as a child. He thinks Peter Peters would have killed her to try and hide, to try and keep her from revealing her past sexual abuse. Uh, he did to her. So the investigators that were going over her case, they kind of had uh, split ideas. Some, one of them thought it was a homicide, one thought it was a suicide, and it was um, based like off of Stanley's assumptions and stories and uh, like she could have committed suicide because of her horrible past or she could have been killed because of her horrible past or because of everything she's been getting into that also could have somehow gotten her in the wrong in with the wrong people or at the wrong t wrong place wrong time kind of situation or it could have completely been a total accident a total f freak accident so Star's body was supposed to be cremated on June 11th but Edwards one of the people working on her case uh, last minute, like, just ordered it to stop because he needed her body still intact for more, um, evidence and stuff. So Edwards was coming at her case as a homicide and he ended up going to Boston and he said he had two suspects that he did not name, but he said one of them was very important in the political field and Andrew Peters was very important in that political field. So the police ended up finding a diary of stars. Uh, it was named like the memory book or mem book or something like that. Um, and they, they, they claimed that they found this diary, but her stepfather said she didn't have a diary. But they found this diary and apparently inside this book there were um, several, there were, she wrote about having sexual relations with over 19 different men. And all of these men were marked by just their initials. And one of the in initials was AJP Andrew J Peters so that just sparked up more of the conspiracy that he did something um, after all of this kind of grew bigger and bigger and bigger Andrews um, ended up getting a lawyer and saying listen I had no sexual relations with this girl at all ever I didn't even see her family I haven't seen her family in five years in the fall of 1931, Andrew Peter was actually officially questioned by the police, but still uh, he denied having any involvement with any with both her murder and or her death and uh, anything previously, like sexually. One of these theories was that she fell from a boat or was pushed from a boat or taken from a boat onto a smaller boat and then pushed from that boat or something like that and then her body washed ashore but because of the sand that was in her lungs and because of all the bruises that were on her body it's believed that she was forcibly drowned closer to shore probably around the same area where her body was found they um the police reportedly like talked to the coast guard and got like all the different information from like the tides and the weather and everything um, around those few days, but none of that information had been published. So there were several attempts to try and figure out the un the unknown man that got in a cab with her. Uh, there were reports that she called the man Brucey, so the police were trying to look into a bunch of different people who had a nickname Brucey or had some sort of name that could have been made into Brucey, uh, but they their, all of their efforts were useless. They also couldn't find this supposed taxi driver that picked her up all the time, which I'm not sure how they would have gotten the information, like he could have came forward anonymously, but when they put out, they even put out rewards for the, the man to step forward and so they could interview him um, and question him, but they never, they never found him. So I'm not sure how they got all this information about her getting in all these taxi cabs if they never found the actual taxi cab driver. But this also sparks the theory that maybe she was abducted by a taxi driver or someone posing as a taxi driver and then since uh, they felt safe enough in the taxi cab or um, it allowed the taxi driver to kill her. Although they investigated the homicide theory as much as they could, they couldn't prove that it was a homicide. So well, now we're going to move on to the suicide theory. While the investigators were pursuing the homicide theory, the Dr. Carr, the one that she went to the boat to see and they had 
did stuff in his room and then he tried to get her to leave and she tried to stay on the boat. That doctor. Once he arrived in London, he received uh, three letters that Starr had written him. Uh, they, she wrote to him on May 30th, June 2nd, and June 4th of 1931. Carr ended up personally carrying these letters back to the United States to give them to the police and to, um, he ended up, he gave them to the investigators around June 23rd. He was also uh, being interviewed at the police at this time and the letters ended up being published in the New York Times. But then at the end of the letter, she ends it by saying, asking if Carr would come see her next time he was in New York. So this kind of made it question, like what were her true intentions? The second letter uh, she sent was she ap apologized for her actions when she wouldn't get off the boat. The third letter was written the day before she disappeared. In this third letter, she wrote that she was planning on committing suicide because she couldn't bear with how much she loved the doctor and how the love wasn't uh, mutual. It said that uh, one of the letters that Carr received there was the line, when you receive this, I will be dead. According to the New York Daily News, this line was, the statement was, quote, when you receive this letter, I will have committed suicide by drowning. Um, but this this quote wasn't, this, this quote was not found in any of the letters that people later went through. So it was believed that Star was, uh, stowed herself away on one of the other cruise liners that were leaving and then took a bunch of sedatives and either purposely jumped off the boat or fell off the boat and because she was sedated ended up drowning and then her body washed ashore uh, to the beach. However, her stepfather, Stanley, still was pushing forward that he believed that her death was a homicide. Because he believed her death was a homicide, he also believed that the letters that she sent were forged and he provided his own handwriting expert to, uh, to go over them. The investigators also believed that um, it was also a homicide because of the amount of drugs in her system. Um, while she was under the influence of the drugs, she was, she was had so many drugs that she wouldn't have been able to coherently commit suicide. Suicide explanation does have a lot of holes in it. Uh, for instance, her clothing that she was found wearing were not damaged. If she was actually in the water for 48 hours, her, dr her dress and her stockings would have been more damaged and they were not damaged at all. She also, or the first, the, this, okay, so she left the boat that she was with the doctor. Apparent, according to the time, the theory is she went to a different boat and then ended up jumping off that boat. But the boat that people are saying she jumped off of, she wouldn't have been able to even board because it left the docks at 10 and she was still visiting the doctor at that time. So she wouldn't have been able to board the boat. And even if she did manage to somehow board the boat, that wouldn't have given her enough time to have this big meal that she supposed that uh, was in her system when they found her. And then going back to the alcohol thing, her autopsy said she hasn't drank in 36 hours. But as I mentioned, there were a lot of witnesses saying she was very intoxicated at least several hours up into her death, depending on when that was. This suggested that she didn't die until June 7th, late June 7th, early June 8th. June 8th would be that Monday that her body was found. So during this investigation, the police were also getting very suspicious of her family. They kept throwing out wild accusations, and when her case started not receiving as much pu publicity as in the beginning, Stanley even went out to say that she was uh, murdered by hired killers, and they uh, were also not cooperating with the police. They were not giving them, they were not bringing forth information, they were not cooperating very well. The New York Daily News uh, also was conducting their own investigation outside of all of this and they uh, published that the faithfuls were in a lot of debt and that they were very not well off and that uh, Stanley was repeatedly going to Peters to get more and more and more money. Stanley then uh, sued the paper, said uh, 
not or this paper and a few other papers for libel, but his claims were uh, dismissed. By October 1931, Star Faithful's case was reported to be virtually closed. Later in December, they had another hearing thing, but it only lasted about 15 minutes and no conclusions were made. The coroner said that no matter what he said, it would just be a matter of opinion. There, there's so many different theories and there's so much evidence that backs up the different theories, but not enough to actually you know, like, give a definite answer. There were also theories that Star somehow got involved with the mob and that these mobsters killed her. And, but no, her case is still unsolved. So that is all I have on this case and it's an unsolved case and it's driving me crazy. Let me know down below if you, what you think it was. If you think it was a homicide or a suicide or an accident or something along those lines. Uh, also comment any other cases or videos altogether that you would like for me to see. Give this a big thumbs up if you liked it. I enjoyed those. And subscribe if you like this content and want to see more. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you have a lovely day.